How are you? I'm alright. <laughs> Mark 10, um, 45 to the end. I can't remember, but we know what we're talking about. We know what we're talking about, which is um, last week we were talking about uh, James and John wanting to sit at the right and the left hand. And now we have Jesus uh, going through Jericho and leaving Jericho and a blind beggar called Bartimaeus espies him coming towards, uh, well, he doesn't see him, <laughs> but he knows that it's Jesus. So he calls out, son of David, have mercy on me. Um, now, one of the interesting things about this is where it's placed. It is, as I say, just after the passage about James and John, but that's just after the final passion prediction. Yeah. So there's something here about the contrast between uh, Bartimaeus and James and John here, isn't there? That James and John still haven't really got it, that actually it was something about following Jesus that is about sacrifice and about the way of the cross. Uh, and that actually what, when they come to Jesus, they ask for him to do this and that for them. The contrast with Bartimaeus is quite striking when we see what happens with the actual uh, passage to discipleship that he goes through. So, for instance, um, uh, he persists in wanting to uh, come to Jesus. The crowd tells him to shut up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But he still persists. And then um, wh when uh, J Jesus hears him, Jesus stands still. He stands still. In other words, he takes notice and attends to him and he says, call him here. Then the crowd go, get up, he's calling you. So what does Bartimaeus do? He immediately throws away his cloak, gets up and comes to Jesus. And there are various aspects of the symbolism of the cloak, but it is pointed out by people like Tom Wright and so on that in Jericho, you would have not needed a cloak during the day. It was, you know, this was actually a beggar's cloak, the stuff that you kind of like had down there that was there for, you know, having money thrown on the cloak. If he's throwing away the cloak, he's already thinking, I'm no longer going to be needing this cloak. Mm -hmm. There's something about an indication of faith here in Jesus and a turning point that's that's uh, remarkable. So, so he comes to Jesus and Jesus asks him exactly the same question that he's asked James and John. Mm -hmm. What do you want me to do for you? But in contrast to James and John, who want uh, this uh, kind of self-aggrandizing left hand and right hand in the kingdom, he simply says, uh, Lord, I want to see. Yeah, I want to see. <laughs> um, and uh, Jesus heals him and says, your faith has saved you. Your faith has saved you. So once again, we get a connection between uh, faith and salvation here with Jesus. And, and one of the interesting things about this that um, Richard Balcom points out is um, how rare it is to ever know the name of any blind beggar from literature in that period. Mm -hmm. Blind beggars were not worth writing about and certainly not worth having their names written about. But Mark has made it uh, made him immortal by mentioning him by name. Mm -hmm. And Balcom suggests that the reason for this is because Mark is, is here pointing out these people are real people. And given the geography of the readers at that time, you could have gone and asked them if this really happened, because mm -hmm. people like Bartimaeus are still around. Mm -hmm. So there's something uh, really quite touching about the fact that we here today in the 21st century are still able to talk about Bartimaeus. Yes. Such is the value even of a blind beggar in contrast to the values at the time. But what we have is then Bartimaeus um, having him his sight restored and following Jesus on the way, which is the way to Jerusalem and the way of the cross. cross Again, yeah. in contrast to James and John. Yeah. Yeah. So a lot here about uh, discipleship for my money. And there are a lot of layers to this. So just, just going to point mm. about... The, the faith, your faith has saved you mm. the faith that his faith is demonstrated by his persistence and you know there's an active quality to this faith it is not something in his mind mm. it's the fact that he has believed enough that he wants to kind of keep crying out yeah um the, i wanted to pick up on a couple of things the, the first was um 
the, one of the things about Mark's gospel is that, of course, like all the gospels, they were written for particular Christian communities or in, 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 they were written in that context. And uh, there's, there's always been a, a sense that the gospels have some liturgical use or mm. at least liturgical reference so that they they kind of echo aspects of the gap the community gathered together in worship <clears throat> and one of the one of the contentions is that this story actually echoes baptism and the process of coming to baptism so that meshes with what you're saying mm. about discipleship and so you know you could you could break it down a little bit and say you know first of all you've got you've got bartimaeus uh calling out and he calls out in Matthew's version he calls out Lord have mercy Kyrie yeah. eleison um uh here he says have mercy on me yeah and the son so, of David is the title and the son mentioned. of David which is and there's another whole uh, dimension to being called the son of David in this but it's a cry uh, have mercy on me mm. which is a you know you can see that as a, a liturgical cry mm. um and uh, and then what you've got is the crowd saying, no, no, shut up. Mm. And what's the crowd? These are the forces of darkness that want to prevent someone coming to faith, that expression mm. of faith. Um, but then Jesus hears him, as you say, and and says, call him. Yeah. So in, in, that, in that kind of scene, if you make the minister of the baptism in Jesus's place saying, call him, Mm. Let him come forward. And so then the, the crowd, the congregation, encourages him, say, go yeah. forward. So they present him to the minister for baptism. And uh, what does he do? I mean, this is a different take on the cloak. Mm. So when, when you're coming to baptism, you remove your outer garment, which mm. is what it was, because you're going to get very wet. Uh, and so he casts that aside again yep. a liturgical gesture and as he he comes to jesus and and to the minister who would be saying um you know i baptize you and uh saying in that same statement encapsulated in that uh, your faith has saved you mm. so you can see there's a there's a sort of liturgical echo in that mm. the baptismal echo and it's and the whole point of it him being a blind beggar is that baptism in the early church was uh, also interpreted as illumination yeah that you <clears throat> you received light and you mm. could see in an illuminated way and so so this is what he you know i i what do you want you know the, the minister saying what do you want you say i want to be you know we say i want to be baptized in the mm. baptism service i want to be illuminated Mm. I want to be able to see. And the, the other thing that struck me is that he, 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 his answer to Jesus is not, I want to see, but I want to see again. Mm. And, uh, and uh, it, what struck me is that the number of times that we, in our own lives, in our own journey of discipleship, find ourselves um, unable to see that you know for all sorts of reasons we get distracted we turn away we, we get drawn away we get overwhelmed by things that 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 are not of god mm. and uh and we suddenly find ourselves in a in a place where we are desperate like bartimaeus calling from the side of the road where you know we don't know what's happening because we can't see but calling out and calling out for mercy and calling out because we want to see again mm. and that being kind of put back on the way put back on the road uh, that process is something you know yeah. you and i both know in our own yeah. lives is yeah. something that is both necessary and happens perhaps perhaps rather a lot in fact mm. which is why peter is such an important model of discipleship i think across the whole of the yeah. gospel because exactly. he's the one who uh, Jesus shows, despite his repeated faithlessness, doesn't actually result in the faithlessness of our Lord towards us. But uh, he is continually committed and uh, uh, reasserts Peter's vocation, even as the risen Lord, doesn't he, towards him? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you.